Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Uh, thank you, Ron. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I greatly appreciate the honor of being uh, part of this uh, Spring Arbor University Socioeconomic uh, Speaker Series, and I thank Tom Cobb um, and sponsors for the program and uh, for supporting individuals and the community enrichment uh, that's entailed. I, I did want to inject some humor uh, in, into this um, uh, presentation, uh, but Duran suggested it might want to go light on uh, the politics. Uh, oh, there goes the, the comedy. Anyway, I, it's, it's, it's back, back to the dismal science, I guess. Uh, now, as you know, the, the title of my remarks uh, this afternoon are uh, Navigating the, the Next Economic Storm. And, and of course, that, that kind of suggests that uh, our nation, and especially Michigan here, uh, have already emerged from uh, the current inclement weather. And, and as, uh, historically, if you look at business cycles, that's, that's false. After all, when you look in retrospect, uh, the economy has not sustained truly a, a, a vigorous uh, upswing. In fact, the Federal Reserve Bank two weeks ago, Ben Bernanke, uh, lowered the income output and employment prospects for the U.S. in the years 2012-2013. Uh, let, me, let me show the first slide, uh, if I could. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll turn that one on because it, it kind of graphically, uh, you know, uh, one, one picture is worth 10,000 words. And w what this shows, um, the f first of the, uh, the, the century, uh, the blue line is the 3%, uh, 3.1% uh, real uh, GDP growth rate of, of the nation. And you can see what the uh, fallout from the uh, 2008 2009 uh, recession looks like here. And th the problem is that that distance, that trillion dollars, that, that's the foregone cost of every, every uh, hour, every moment, every year that we spend below our potential. And in a normal cycle, that uh, black line comes up to converge. Uh, and to exceed the blue line. So you, you, you get makeup and catch up and pent up demand and is recovered as well as investment. Uh, to the extent our potential is up here and our actual growth rate, even if it comes back to the 3% that lies below where we were, we're, we're giving up uh, roughly a trillion dollars worth of uh, potential. So that's, that's the truth, and that's where um, we've departed from a typical uh, uh, cyclical situation. Uh, that having been said, and it sounds very negative, but the fact is that there has been growth, and for some of the firms that are in the export-related operations, the uh, past couple of years, quite frankly, have been uh, surprisingly strong weak dollar and so forth, but also the exigencies of uh, meeting the challenges uh, has been positive and, and to some extent profitable as well. In fact, as of, as of September, the new durable goods uh, orders are up 5% from a year ago. If you exclude the very volatile transportation component of durable goods orders, uh, durable goods being those goods that have lifespans at least three years, um, the actual increase year over year is 8%. Another good indicator of positive activity is, of course, the Industrial Production Index. And for sure, this manufacturing indicator um, ha has slowed in recent months, but it's still 3.3% above last year. And it's a, it's a very important index, the Industrial Production Index, for two reasons. One is that the uh, manufacturing sector is, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a obviously a, a major component of productivity. Uh, if you subtract from that 3.3%, it's been my experience, about half a percentage point, you have a very good indication of what the real GDP for the quarter will be. The fact is the preliminaries for the third quarter were about 2.5% uh, real growth. And again, that, that's pretty close to what happens. If you look at a coincident indicator like the Industrial Production Index, you, you get a pretty good um, uh, indication of where GDP is, is, uh, is heading. Another positive factor for the uh, economy at this juncture, folks, is the yield curve. Uh, yield curve is by far the finest predictive index uh, of what the next year will look like. Uh, the yield curve, it's the difference between, I take the difference between the rate on the 10-year Treasury, uh, which is hovering around 2%, 
and a very short-term uh, rate like um, the three-month treasury or federal funds rate, the bank uh, interbank tr trading uh, of funds, which is for all intents and purposes zero. So you got a 2% positive constructive yield curve and that always foreshadows growth. Uh, and it has, I mean that's been 3% for the last couple years and it has uh, brought us a growth, uh, just not at the pace that you'd normally have, uh, leaving a very severe uh, recession. Uh, obviously, the construction arena is one that's uh, still down. It's down about, um, if you look at the home prices, about 10% uh, year over year. Um, uh, Michigan uh, still ranks uh, fourth in terms of leading the, the nation in uh, foreclosures. And uh, employment, as you know, in the construction uh, industry is still contracting. As we close this year, uh, there remain two areas of economic concern. There are overhangs from the recession uh, of, of uh, 08 and 09, and they represent legacy costs that will retard growth somewhat and profitability as well uh, in the year ahead. The first is the year-over-year -year acceleration in the consumer price index. Um, you don't hear much of that from the officials, uh, especially from the Federal Reserve, but it's up nearly 4% from last year. If you look at wholesale prices, which are also uh, very important in uh, presaging the uh, coming um, results in the consumer price index, wholesale prices are up 7% year-over-year. So that's something to watch. It's very um, threatening to businesses, to profit margins, and also to households trying to struggle uh, uh, in their um, me meeting uh, obligations. The second uh, is the exceptionally low level of consumer confidence, especially in the household sector. Uh, presently, just to give you perspective, uh, ho household uh, confidence is roughly half of what it was that pervaded the uh, sector uh, prior to the recession. Uh, that's very low uh, collective sentiment and it does foreshadow continued caution, obviously greater saving rates in the months ahead. Uh, essentially our economy is held hostage to what? To un uncertainty. The unresolved policy questions are becoming critical. Obviously they, they include the field of health care, energy, taxes, debt, uh, deficits, Europe's deepening financial crises, um, rising military challenges, the greater political turbulence that I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll see uh, intensify in a rancorous uh, national election next year. Uh, and as daunting as this environment may appear to be from our planning points of view, uh, I think it actually carries some rather straightforward and focused conclusions. Let me share that. Uh, one, in business and university, you, you keep investment spending at elevated levels in order to maintain higher capital to labor ratios. You have no choice. Uh, this along with continued use of contract labor, temporary labor, should assure uh, good productivity, the gains that can protect your profit margins. It's a defensive strategy. I'll say more about that in a minute. Likewise, don't overreach. Don't blow your health care, uh, I'm sorry, your, 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 what, what would be uh, anticipating problems. Uh, uh, maintain that healthy cash reserve. That's what businesses have at this point. Uh, they'll help transition the coming year. Uh, again, the ex extraordinary uh, amounts of uncertainty. You want to do that in terms of protecting cash, uh, whether you're at the household or, or at the, in, in the firms, because uh, cash affords flexibility, number one, uh, provides uh, opportunities to acquire productive assets at uh, who knows when, but the propitious moments. Um, or to navigate the unforeseen crises between now and 2012 that I don't know about. Um, so what's the bottom line? You have to know with greater certainty the likely outcome of the policy changes. Tax rates, energy, regulation, which way will they break? 
Uh, we're not talking about risk, we're talking about uncertainty. There's a big difference in a market system. Now over the next uh, 16 months, um, I label that the near term, I think we'll see about 1.5% real GDP uh, growth uh, nationally, about 3.5% inflation. Normally, I have to tell you that uh, looking at the business cycle, whenever there was a prolonged period of inflation exceeding the real GDP growth rate, that was one of my personalized indicators of, of problems ahead. Uh, we'll see. Uh, at a minimum, we call that situation a muddling along um, situation. I think the euphemism that we usually applied was stagflation. In case that sounds like, uh, like uh, something that, that isn't going to happen, I have to tell you that this uh, situation of uh, re relatively lower real growth than inflation is the same kind of sclerosis, for the most part, that's been afflicting the EU, and with the exception of the inflation part of it, the slow growth has been affecting Japan for the better part of two decades. Um, you reach a situation like this, as you all well know, um, when an economic system um, is in a situation where they cannot meet uh, the, the um, the promises, the promised entitlements uh, that have been legislated uh, when you have a welfare state. Um, politically, financially, most advanced Western economies, includes ours, um, have beggared many generations of yet unborn citizens. Consequently, we've now reached both a fiscal and monetary impasse uh, in, terms, in terms of the policies. Uh, you, 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 you can ask, uh, are we going to surmount these impasses? And indeed, we can. Um, what will we do to alter the outcome? Well, uh, we certainly will not overcome uh, a national bankruptcy or a monetary chaos by raising taxes and therefore handing Washington or whatever public sector is there more of the private sector's resources. And we will most assuredly not uh, improve the confidence or the stability of the national economic or financial uh, outlook uh, by injecting another trillion dollars of funny money or, or, or reserves, bank reserves, in, into uh, a system where the Fed has already, um, in the past three years, built up uh, $2 trillion of additional reserves. Uh, to tell you the truth, it must haunt most of our policymakers today. Uh, policymakers like Boehner and, and Reed, and the appointees like uh, Geithner and, and, and uh, Bernanke, uh, to contemplate within a few days this kick the can down the road outcome um, that's likely to result from so-called super committee um, recommendations. Uh, the only way to stop kicking this can down the road um, is to reverse the size of the public sector relative to the private sector. Uh, government has to return to the basic limited functions that, uh, that the Constitution uh, essentially tells us. Uh, the protection of life and property being the foremost priority. Uh, I mean, at, at this late date, uh, and this is what, what you just don't seem to get from, from Washington, politicians, whether they're in Greece or in Italy, they fear civil unrest if they are perceived at reneging on the political promises. And yet, it's, it's, it, to me, it's quite ironic. Um, the, the process of prudent and rational belt tightening is precisely the characteristic uh, most akin to what we've done in the households and the firms over the past three years. And I'm sure that's true here in Jackson, always has been in my experience, uh, and at uh, private universities. Um, if we believe our financial situation differs markedly from that of Greece, uh, think again. Uh, so what needs to happen? Uh, spending needs to be rolled back, not slowed, but rolled back if, if we're talking about the, uh, the public sector. You have to have the discipline, the focus on priorities that confronts any household. Uh, 
that can't afford, especially the debt, that it continues to run up um, on a maxed out uh, credit card. Uh, so I'll give, you, I'll give you an example from the hearth, because I always, we, we do this in, the, in our household every single year, uh, this time of the year. Uh, but if the household faces a lost income from, from, from layoffs or, or reduced or faltering demand for our services, then, or, or from uh, the um, reduced capacity for borrowing uh, from an underwater housing situation or a portfolio, uh, uh, investment portfolio, what, what do we do? We review the, review the annual budget. Immediately, we rank the outlays by uh, priority. Um, it, the luxuries would be dropped, the uh, entertainment would be uh, temporarily or permanently uh, chopped or curtailed, the gifts and donations might have to be suspended, uh, vacation travel beyond family visits of course uh, would be omitted, the extra landscaping, I don't know, uh, uh, cable TV might have to be postponed, uh, you, you know the routine, the, the, the budgets on food or on apparel. Uh, certainly would be scaled back. A cautious, uh, extremely cautious use of um, utilities. Uh, that, that, would, that would be not just the order of the day, but the order of the year. Uh, and we actually ran through the computation of our own budget, and we do it every year, as I said. Uh, and we, we make that as a percent of all the income we have, in, in our case, a pension and a Social Security. It came to 20 to 25 percent. Do you know, folks, what the uh, equivalent would be for Washington, a, a 20 to 25 percent savings per year? That's 800 billion to a trillion dollars every year on a 3.7 to 4 a trillion dollar budget. Uh, and they have a lot of options. The elimination of waste and fraud, abiding by Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. No, I don't say it lightly. You know, you know, you've seen the figures. They've been out every year. $65 uh, billion dollars in recognizable fraud in the Medicare program alone. I, I mean, it just it doesn't even scratch the surface. Um, it, oh, and, and none of that accounts for the sale of assets, which also comes into play. And it also, the, everything I've mentioned has its counterpart, as you well know, in the budgets of the public entity um, in Washington. Um, there are, there's a huge amount, a third of the land in, in, in the United States is, is, is federal government owned. Um, they have lots of redundant facilities uh, that could be rented out or put back on the tax rolls. And when you get into a desperate situation, that's what you do. Uh, where are they? I mean, do they, uh, the problem is they're not serious, at least not yet. Anyway, um, and, and you know, obviously the candidates uh, uh, have trouble thinking of it, but I don't have any trouble thinking of it. I, where, <laughs> where, where, where is it? Where is it mandated? Or where is it written in, in the U.S. Constitution, especially at this time, that there should be departments of agriculture, of housing, of transportation, commerce, energy, welfare, uh, education, e EPA, uh, the Fannie Mae, the Freddie Mac, uh, or, or the whole alphabet soup? of uh, regulatory agencies, as opposed to having those functions, if the states want to do it in a, in a federal system, having the states do it. So um, it, it clearly in 2012, uh, you got to separate the rhetoric from the reality and keep an eagle, out, e eagle eye out for such uh, spending reforms um, uh, that, that at least adhere a bit better to our U.S. Constitution. Uh, because if Washington cannot tighten its spending belt, then obviously it's back on us as firms and households to batten down our hatches further. So as I stand before you, our national debt exceeds the entire GDP of the nation by $3 trillion, um, which approximates Greece's stand. Uh, just the outstanding publicly held debt of the U.S. is $17 trillion, and that excludes the interagency debt like Social Security. The interest paid annually on this debt, even with interest rates at an, uh, like a century level low, is closing in 
on half a trillion dollars, $454 billion every year. That's an eighth of all the federal spending. And it's, it, if interest rates move up and the cost of the, uh, the, the government debt moves up, it's going to absorb very quickly a, qu a quarter. So here, here, here we are as a nation, 950 days, almost 1,000 days of not having had a Congress that pa presented a legitimate budget for the 2012 year, a, a year that will show a 1.3, 1.5 trillion deficit. Uh, I say, good heavens, and, uh, you know, w what are they doing? What is this? Why do we have to contend with this? It, it, it quite frankly reminds me of the kid who comes home from, from school. Mom asks, uh, how was school today? And kid says, uh, it didn't go very well. Well, what, what happened? <laughs> well, I got blamed for something I didn't do. Well, that's very serious, Mom says. Uh, maybe I should go into school and talk to your teacher. Well, what is it that you didn't do? My homework. <laughs> it's getting to be quite juvenile. Um, you, you have to ask it right back in the end of the, in the grassroots. Uh, what would happen to your business uh, your, your, uh, if that were your strategy? What would be your fate, more to the point, uh, as a company or as a university uh, president, that if that were your modus operandi? Uh, on the other hand, especially around Jackson, I, I understand that uh, prison, food, and health care uh, recreation facilities are not too shabby. but. But, but that's a problem. And in addition to that, of course, not to belabor it much more, but our situation is, is fundamentally worse because we have, as opposed to many of these other countries we're looking at in Europe, a, a very deeply institutionalized, entrenched, unfunded liability situation that moves into the realm of 60 to, uh, depending on the time frame of the century here, from about 60 uh, to uh, $120 trillion. Um, so before it all implodes, it would be nice to think that Uncle Sam would adopt a more disciplined household approach to saving and spending. So um, again, that goes back to the priorities. And again, it reminds me of a kid who's playing basketball in the driveway and one of his contact lenses falls out. If he's searching out there for an hour, can't find it, totally in vain, goes in, tells his mom. Uh, who goes out to look for it, and within a minute and a half, she comes back with her fist, and in the fist is, is the uh, contact lens. And the kid, now how'd you work that miracle, Mom? Well, it depends. Uh, it, it wasn't hard at all. The difference is you were looking for a piece of plastic, and I was looking for $150. <laughs> so, so focus, focus is everything. And until Washington understands, and here's the real point, that. $150 doesn't just come from a printing press, but represents a sacrifice of labor today for the enhancement of tomorrow. Uh, until that happens, that recognition, they'll, continuing, they'll, be, uh, they'll continue to diminish our tomorrows. It, it isn't just, and it's not a st stable. The other thing I'm worried about is, and especially as the politics ramp up for 2012, uh, all you hear about is this mantra of, of, of jobs, jobs, jobs. But I can tell you, as that crescendo, uh, uh, as it begins to crescendo for next year, uh, it's nonsense. The logic is bass backwards. Uh, the focus has to be uh, not on jobs, but, but on, on the improving of the business climate uh, in order to create the jobs. Uh, otherwise, uh, they're putting the cart before the horse. Uh, it's, the, it's the epitome of ignorance, economic ignorance, and mental disorganization, and it fails every time. Um, I, I, I could cite my recent experiences on the uh, Federal Reserve Board, um, they, uh, the, um, what they call the, our contribution to the board, that is. It's a round table, and uh, they always meet to get input for the Beige Book, their policy-making book for the Board of Governors in Washington. Uh, and they want to hear uh, what we in the boondocks uh, think uh, and are hearing and learning from business uh, leaders like yourselves. Uh, and lately, I've been rather uh, uh, astounded by the cavalier response by some of the uh, participants, uh, I mean, the, uh, and, and the people at the Fed, because 
uh, they, they listen to, to it and they say, well, maybe it's time, therefore, to inject this uncertainty into the model of, of the behavior, and we ought to study it. So they're going to put it before 500 PhD uh, economists in, in their, um, in their uh, offices. And, and I say to myself, wait a minute, we don't need a new model. We understand what that's all about. The, what I'm hearing is that businesses, they want to hire, they want to lend, they want to expand, they want to spend on plant equipment, inventories, uh, but they can't do as much as they like. The reason is they're afraid that the, of the policy changes that no one knows anything about that will whipsaw any such decisions, uh, making a, what a, a, normally would be a good decision into a, a defeat for their purposes and their profits. Uh, EPA with the boilers uh, that could cost in 10 year, within 10 years, there's new tighter regulations on 10,000 boilers across the, the country. Uh, that, that could be 800,000 uh, jobs and, and $350 billion costed out um, it, within a, over a 10 year period. The Keystone uh, uh, pipeline uh, from Canada's uh, Athabascan and, and tar sands to, to the, I mean, these are jobs that are just going by the wayside, and we never get in the fundamental uh, energy field, which is input to everything in an economic uh, system, especially an advanced economic system. Here in Jackson, you, you have the employers working with practically every major industry imaginable autos, aircraft, agriculture, energy extraction, transportation, in infrastructure, everything. Um, so the potential is terrific. I'll, I'll just mention two or three real quickly uh, in autos. Think about it. By this time in a business cycle, we ought to be selling here in this country 18 million units a year and instead, instead of the 12 to 13 million uh, that we are. Uh, just the scrappage rates at 13 million units, the pent-up demand brings that a lot higher. And, um, and so forth. And you look at uh, microcosm of, of the energy industry in two states, uh, North Dakota, where they have the Bakken fields for oil shale, uh, they're exploiting it. Same in the northern four counties in Pennsylvania. Um, they've added 80,000 jobs there uh, in, in Pennsylvania, directly. Indirectly, it's about 120,000 just in the last two years. Um, revenues to the government, revenues to the, the people. Uh, same, same thing in um, in North, North Dakota, North Dakota, the lowest unemployment rate, 3.4 percent in the nation for two years. Uh, fastest growth in personal income in the nation for two years in a row. The examples, the empirical, everything's out there. And here's Michigan. Michigan sitting on Antrim, the Antrim shale basin, and a lot others doing nothing. Same with New York, up until recently, doing nothing with, with their uh, energy uh, potential. So anyway, th those are some of the things that, that characterize the, uh, the potentials that we have uh, to, to recover, not only our equilibrium, but uh, uh, become a growth model for, for the nation. Uh, now, with regard to uh, Michigan, um, 2012 and beyond. I'm just going to uh, cut to the chase. I can show it in the slides, but uh, I, I think you're, you're probably pretty well aware of it. Um, Michigan's kind of been missing in action when uh, Illinois, for example, uh, earlier this year decided to raise uh, income taxes on its firms. Um, by uh, of, of 67 percent, and on its uh, personal income tax by uh, 46 percent. A Caterpillar, Motorola, a whole bunch of industries said, "Hey, enough's enough. We're leaving." And indeed, as uh, my wife and I were driving into uh, Chicago to visit the family, um, you drive along the Skyway, and there's a huge billboard posted uh, by Indiana. You know what it said? It said, "Illinois enough. Uh, come to Indiana." <laughs> That's essentially the offers that, uh, that Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, they were all making. The, where was Michigan? Where was Michigan in that competition? Uh, and so on. There, there are three things that have to be done for Michigan to restore its uh, premier uh, economy instead of being complacent. The first would be a cut. In, in spending, like a Chris Christie, 15% across the board. That's about $8 uh, uh, billion out of the budget. Um, 
which the Mackinac Center, and you'll probably see some of the materials handed out, uh, could do with two things, and that's convergence of the compensation of public uh, employees in the state, that's pay and benefits, 80% above the private sector counterpart, uh, converge that uh, from the public to the private sector amount. Um, uh, that's roughly six uh, billion dollars annually, uh, right away. And uh, the other, of course, is uh, you, you competitively bid. They can still remain in the public sector, but in the 551 public school districts in the state of Michigan, um, th there are four major non-instructional uh, types of services: cafeteria, custodial, transportation, and which one? Uh, and healthcare. And if those were competitively bid, uh, you'd, you'd net another $2 billion a year. So you can easily get to those if you're serious. So spending is always the, the premier uh, uh, thing you start with. And then secondly, you have to phase out, that would allow a phase out of the corporate and the personal income taxes as nine other states in the US have done. And the final thing, of course, is to pass right to work legislation. They know that the 22 right to work states, that's uh, if you want to join a union, fine, but you're not coerced into it, uh, or, or that, or paying union dues. Uh, those two reforms allow you to, um, on average, have a, a, a family income of $11,000 per year higher. That's how, again, you close the gap with Michigan, whose personal income now is 13% below uh, the national average. So in summary, I do forecast a positive but uh, sluggish year ahead. Uh, there's lots of fiscal and monetary stimulus out there, but frankly, it's, it's not the kind that truly gives a broad-based boost uh, to uh, the entire economy rather than picking and choosing segments of it. I think interest rates will remain volatile, but they'll be at low levels, mostly because of uncertainty. And uh, it's the uncertainty that keeps the turnover rate, the velocity of money, uh, very, very low. Uh, so the best advice I think I can offer is to maintain a cautious, margin protective, cost conscious, um, defensive game between now and November 2012. Between now and then, uh, develop a dual set of con contingency plans, one that is uh, aggressive, and one that is super defensive. Uh, as you tweak the plans, as you get more information, do a reasonable amount of, of, of praying. God bless you, your firms, your workers. Thanks again uh, for your invitation. I really value uh, being a kickoff speaker here this afternoon. Please have a happy and a healthy Thanksgiving, all of you. Thank you. you have time? Let me try to respond, uh, at least uh, hastily, to uh, some of the, um, the questions you might have at this point. Yes, sir. Uh, consumer deleveraging right now is, is due to the, I, I think, the fear that everyone has in the economy. People trying to get rid of as much debt as they can. Right. How is that affecting our economic growth? In other words, as people de deleverage, obviously you're not out buying a new car, so yeah. it's kind of a No, it, th this is always the preparation for a recovery. People's saving rate went from minus to 7%. Now it's at 4%, personal saving rate. And you see the counterpart in what firms are doing. It's not lost to the economy. Just because you save, savings, it's a tautology. It goes into investment. So you have a, a you know, stock market that's moved up uh, quite, quite nicely. Uh, so none of that is lost, goes into uh, state-of-the-art investments. Uh, it, it's not lost to the system. And this is something the economists seem not to understand. The accountants have a very good handle on it, the difference between a balance sheet and a current income account. But, uh, I, but the idea is you can't have the GDP, which is an income expense type statement, a flow, a flow measure. Uh, you don't have any action in that before you have the ratios achieved on the balance sheet, which are the cash to asset fundamentally, once people and corporations have restored to their comfort levels uh, the, the cash to a a liquid assets to, you know, part of the total assets, that's what kicks off the, uh, the GDP kind of growth and the spending. You restore what you're comfortable with 
given the uncertainty, it's taking longer, and I don't know whether we're going to get that unless we have a resolution of some of these, these policy questions. But it does happen. There's nothing unusual. It's just the, un the overhang of the uncertainty that kills it. Yeah? We were talking about cutting and spending. What about the subsidies that um, Washington is oh. famous for trading over? Yeah, I mean, it's a capture the flag. This is the mentality of a zero-sum political game versus a, a, a positive-sum economic system where you, the idea is to expand the pie. Um, and, and so capture the flag means you, know, you go to Washington, you get your lobbyists to try to capture as much for you and, and get your special interests taken care of rather than think of the national uh, welfare or the way what they should be doing is the business climate again rather than pick and choose. You see it at every level. You see it at the national level and it's uh, permeated all of the state functions. You have huge departments now doing nothing but picking and choosing whether it's a film industry or stuff. <laughs> The whole idea is if it's good for one, it should be good for all. And if you can't come to that moral conclusion, you're in quicksand. And that's what we're finding ourselves. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, a lot of experts think the reason Greece is struggling so mightily is because they've passed a tipping point where a greater part of, part of their citizenry is now on the dole versus the people generating mm -hmm. those assets to pay for that. How close do you think the U.S. is to, to that tipping point? Well, we're, we're, I think you've already seen it as microcosms if you take many of our largest cities, including here in Michigan, where there are more people depending on uh, the beneficence of uh, the general public uh, than are, who are working gainfully uh, and productive. So when that happens, you've essentially uh, got a black hole. You, you've, left, you've lost the economy. Um, and they have to rest they'll have to refine it. And the only way, you're not doing them a favor, you're not doing Detroit a favor uh, by kicking the can down the road or subsidizing $300 million from the general taxpayer every year. That just treats uh, the, them paterni paternally. Uh, and if it, if it goes on, of course, the only uh, re rectification comes through a, a very, you, you don't have any more money. You, you've essentially taken away all the resources and you're seeing that. The country has no, no, no funds, no, except the funny money that Ben Bernanke might be induced to, as he said in, in 01, throw out, go, go up with a thousand helicopters and throw the money out of them. That's what he's doing. He's building the same bubble in the stock market today that his predecessor, his mentor, Alan Greenspan, did with the housing industry you know, six years ago. Yeah. Given, given what you just said, and the <coughs> fairly, very low target on that super committee, how likely do you think it is uh, that this is going to result in a hyperinflation? Yeah, eventually, 40 centuries of, of uh, history, that I, recorded history in economics says that it always results in a uh, debasement of the currency when you've run out of the productive and the incentives that would give you the normal kind of growth. Um, you run out of that and, and, and pretty much you're left to another facet of government to, to cheapen the currency. And, and you, that's, but it doesn't last very long, whether it's Hungary in the last century, Germany in the last century, or any other example. It only lasts a very short period of time, and then you, you restore it either through a barter, barter system or a resurgence of growth. A stock portfolio that goes back to ownership, those firms that own basic, basic resources, uh, Procter & Gamble, whatever, it, it caters to human need or, or, or to better, faster, cheaper technology stuff, they always regain. Yeah, you'll lose a whole bunch of them, so it has to be diversified, but that'll always come through better than any other type of investment. I think I better, yep. Yeah, one, more. one more question. Um, okay, you run? Tom. I'll tell you, on the school board was about the uh, <laughs> low, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, that, that was tough enough. You know, try a busing question, on, <laughs> you put on your helmet and you leave. <laughs> Thank you all again so much.